Prepare to experience the strongest radio allowable by law. Secrets will be revealed. Myths dispelled. From the studio gym where excuses never apply. It's Superhuman Radio with your host, Carl Lenore. Hey, hey, welcome back to another episode of Superhuman Radio. Do you realize the third Saturday in November marks our 17th year doing this podcast consistently, continuously? Lots of things happened. Excuse me. Lots of things have happened along the way that should have stopped us, but they haven't. This is the longest running health and fitness podcast in the world, and we're going to keep on rolling. Um, also, if you want to keep up with the show, you better sign up for our newsletter email. We don't send out any newsletters, so don't think that we're going to bog down your inbox with uh, a bunch of gibberish. But I can tell you that we're looking for a new home. Uh, YouTube, Facebook, they're just not good anymore. We have been delivering real science on this show for 17 years. We talk about things on this show that are five to 10 years ahead of anything else, any, any other uh, media outlet. But nowadays, when you do that, you're told it's misinformation. So if you go to superhumanradio.net, down at the bottom right-hand corner of the page, you'll see where you can sign up for the newsletter. I promise we won't spam you. But keep in touch with us because it's getting increasingly harder for us to get our message out there now uh, with this new way of uh, cancel culture. And uh, we'll keep you updated because I have something exciting that I'm working on um, that we are probably going to get away from Facebook and YouTube and all of those platforms that just want to censor us. And we're just talking about science. We have legitimate authors of, of real scientific papers, peer reviewed papers on this show. And they, they bounce me for two weeks at a time because, uh, it didn't meet their community standards. Their community standards are to dumb down people and not endow people with knowledge. Well, that's our goal to endow people with knowledge. And today is a perfect example of that. We have two great interviews today. Um, the, the, the first one, I've got to put these up in front of me for a second, so I want, to, I want to get this right. So the first one, we're going to be talking with Alexandra Johnstone about timing your calorie load for weight loss, but more importantly, for hunger. Hunger drives weight loss, let's be honest. If, you, if you're hungry all the time, you're starving all the time, you're going to eat more. So we're going to get into this discussion in just a minute. And then, as you know, we are the leaders in peptide information. And we have a great peptide show today. Dr. Quinn Yang, uh, Wang, I'm sorry, is going to be with us. There's a new peptide that has been synthesized that has profound effects on Alzheimer's and epilepsy. You're going to want to know about this one. So stay with us. Of course, we have to thank our title sponsor, and that is Legendary Foods for making the tasty pastry and now the sweet roll. The tasty pastry is what was designed to be a better choice for a pop tart less than one gram of sugar 20 grams of high quality dairy protein uh, four to five net carbs for those of us who are low carb people and it tastes decadent it tastes great your children will eat it it tastes like real pastry and also now the new sweet roll that just came out comes in chocolate cinnamon uh, uh, it's a sugar-coated cinnamon, like a Cinnabon that you get in the airport. Uh, but again, less than one gram of sugar, 20 grams of high-quality uh, dairy protein, and uh, four to five net carbs. I think one of them only has two uh, net carbs. Go to shrnetwork.biz slash legendary and use the code SHR10 today to check them out. By using the code, you get a 10% discount. You can probably get 10% discounts other places as well. But this lets them know that you learned about it here on Superhuman Radio. And now, without further delay, Dr. Alexandra Johnstone, welcome to the show. Can you hear me? Yeah, sure. It's just the, I, was, I think you muted me earlier. So, hi, Carl. Yes, thank you for inviting me to speak to you. So, um, to get started, why was this study necessary? What work had preceded it uh, that this was the next, next logical uh, study? 
So I suppose if we think about what my interests are, I'm a professor based at the University of Aberdeen, at the Rowett Institute. And I'm really interested in the relationship between diet and health. And if we think about the current dietary advice for people to lose weight, it's basically along the lines of a calorie is a calorie <laughs> and it doesn't matter what time of day you consume that calorie. Um, basically, you will lose weight if energy intake is less than energy expenditure, i.e. if you're in a negative energy balance. And there were some papers published in 2013 that really challenged this assumption. And this comes from the circadian rhythm field. So mm -hmm. some of these studies are in animal models. But what I want to do is touch on some of the studies in humans, which suggested that eating at different times of the day had different effects on energy utilisation, which meant that it led to different differential weight loss. And this was surprising because the authors claimed it was um, when this happened when subjects consumed isocaloric amounts, meaning the same amount of calories. And what they suggested was that um, subjects who consumed more food in the morning period lost more weight than subjects that consumed more food in the evening period. So these studies really imply that calorie utilisation varies across the day, meaning different times of the day. Um, with calories that are consumed in the morning are less efficiently utilised than calories consumed in the evening. And that perhaps um, impacted on differences in energy expenditure relative to intake and means that there's differential weight loss. Uh, didn't, didn't we learn this from Keckwick and Pawan in the 1950s? So a lot of this research you know, harks back to studies that were conducted many years ago. I suppose I can go even further back than that. There's a saying perhaps you've heard of that uh, breakfast like a king and dine like a pauper, which is uh, linked to uh, a very old um, saying and with any good myth I think it has perhaps a hint of truth in it so I think um, what I would say is that there have been no controlled studies in humans with gold standard techniques to measure both energy intake and energy expenditure to test this out and that's what we did. Wow that's awesome. Um I was going to talk about the microbiome a little bit later, but I'm trying to understand the diurnal effect of um, intake. Uh, so there, there are some microbes, and I, I'm going to get this wrong, I know, but there's bacterial deets and firmicutes. And one is associated with greater energy ex extraction from what you eat and a suppression of energy expenditure. And the other is associated with uh, less energy extraction from what you eat and higher energy expenditure. Can 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 that in any way be explained? This diurnal effect that that you you just referenced. So I I wouldn't intuitively link the microbiome as one of the mechanisms, and the reason for that is as humans, our transit time from mouth to anus is uh, over quite a prolonged period of time. It could be from 12 hours to 36 hours. Yeah. So actually, if we think about the circadian rhythms, what we're talking about is um, circa, meaning around a day. So circadian rhythms uh, is around about 24 hours. And if we, and that's our daylight and night time. So with, within a 24 hour period, it would be very difficult to detect changes in microbiome by measuring that in faecal samples and that's basically mm -hmm. it's not a dynamic process faecal samples only measure what comes out of course you can infer what goes on but it's a bit of a black box there of course you, there's other ways of measuring microbiome um perhaps in the blood but this is very new it's i haven't seen 
Uh, you could collect saliva. There's inferences that there are circadian rhythms in other processes. There's circadian rhythms in most of our tissue. And of course, the brain is the control center of the circadian rhythm. And it's taking the cues from the light through the eyes and that controls um, the circadian sort of ebb and flow, the rise and uh, fall of our normal hormone system. But this is bi-directional and the food that we eat and the regular pattern of sleep, which you've touched on there and eating, means that uh, these are uh, cues that help regulate the circadian rhythm. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, I'm a 24 hour transit time. I, about a decade ago, I ate uh, charcoal, you know, powdered charcoal with my morning meal. And then I watched for when it actually showed up in the, uh, in my excrement and it was pretty fascinating. I, I, I never realized that it takes that long. And as you point out, even 36 hours. Um, I, I wanna just ask one more question about this phenomenon, this diurnal um, phenomenon of uh, how we extract more energy from the the, uh, the morning meal than, than the, no, we, we extract, extract less, you said, right? It's, it's less efficient in the morning but in the evening, it's more efficient. Is, is there some sort of evolutionary explanation for that about food availability and for, for millions of years that could explain that? So it would really be if you lose more weight in the morning period, then it would be that you'd be perhaps more, yes, you could argue whether you're more or less responsive in terms of energy metabolism or energy expenditure. So from an evolutionary perspective, uh, if you think about this in a national way, then we would have been hunter gatherers would have been collecting food during the daylight period when they could see, mm -hmm. and then um, resting during the night period. So it's normal for humans to to be active, to be eating during the light cycle, and to be sleeping and resting during the dark cycle. There is, of course, exceptions to this, um, and that's shift workers. Right. So shift workers can be people who are in regular routines, a regular night shift worker. And that's not what I tend to refer to. It's people who are changing shifts. And I'm sure your listeners can reflect on that even if they chin change their own shift pattern through jet lag. So that's the other paradigm. Um, then you feel you know, you, your body is still at the old time zone and you're trying to re-establish that circadian clock. Um, so I was in the US this summer and by the time, you know, I'd spent four days, I was still horrendously jet lagged and then flew home again and then was jet lagged going back to the UK. So it does take time to reset this. And if you're changing shifts, um, like in the medical profession, going from day to long shifts, overnight shifts, it's incredibly disruptive to the circadian system. And that has quite a profound impact for some people on, their, on the digestive system, but also appetite control as well in terms of poor sleep. Uh, insulin sensitivity is diurnal. Uh, we learned several years ago on the, uh, talking about a uh, study um, does that speak to this phenomenon that you that we're going to talk about in the, in your paper today? Yes, that's a that's a good point. So um, we do know that um, we are more um, glucose sensitive um, in the morning and than in the evening. So that would infer that if you're going to be um, consuming um, a carbohydrate rich meal that you'd be more um, efficient in dealing with that carbohydrate load in terms of insulin release. release. And I'm not talking about people with type 2 diabetes right. or with impaired glucose tolerance. I'm talking about healthy individuals. It's a normal response that we do know that's correct, that we have a diurnal response, more sensitive in the morning, less, less sensitive in the evening. Okay. Well, now, let's talk about the paper. How, how was the study designed? So the study is always designed for my studies that are looking at appetite control in the way that we call within subject. So each subject acts as their own control and receives both dietary treatments. So I'm very lucky at the Rowett Institute. We've got dietitians that will prepare individually um, prescribed diets for my volunteers. 
So that means I can con completely control energy intake. So we design diets that were weight loss diets and isocaloric, so the same amount of total calories that were provided each for four weeks as the big breakfast regime, which we call in the paper the morning loaded, or the big dinner regime, which in the paper we call evening loaded. And I presume that you'll share the link for the paper that I'm talking yes, about. It, it, yeah, this it'll be in the final. When we, when we post the show, it'll be in there. So this is the paper we published recently in Cell Metabolism. And to give some perspective about the diets that we're feeding, when we talk about a big breakfast, we are giving 45% of calories in that morning period and only 20% of calories in the evening. So that's big breakfast, small dinner. And then we switch that around to a small breakfast, 20% of calories, big dinner, 45% of calories, which means lunch is always the same. And in the UK, I know that actually the big dinner regime is the more usual. We don't mm -hmm. tend to, in the UK, consume most of our calories in the morning. We tend to consume most of our calories in the evening period. So I'm sure, you know, if I could speak to your listeners, I would ask how many of you skipped breakfast this morning? You were in a rush. Maybe you're tired. Maybe you need an extra sleep. Did you take snacks with you? Were you eating, travelling? Um, so these are all modern um, uh, eating patterns where we've progressively changed our eating patterns to eat more in the evening period. Well, in fact, there's the, the phenomenon of, I just want to inject this, I'm sorry, but there's a phenomenon of intermittent fasting now, or or um, what do they call it, time-restricted feeding that is associated with, you know, anti-aging. I, I, I did intermittent fasting for a very long time, and I discovered that it was actually, I, 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 it was, I, I wasn't responding to it. I eat a big breakfast now and I do much better. I fare much better. I'm not hungry until later in the day. But what about those people who are saying, well, I do intermittent fasting, time restricted feeding, and that's supposed to be better for you? Yeah, no, I mean, that's a really great question. Time restricted feeding um, is really trendy just now, but there are different forms of that, whether we call it intermittent fasting, but uh, TRF, time restricted feeding, um, usually means that you have an eating window uh, of maybe six hours, eight hours. I've read some papers with 10 hours. So um, the question then is, do you make your eating window after an extended overnight fast? So you, it's easy to fast overnight because you're asleep and then you skip breakfast and then eat later in the day. Or do you get up, have breakfast and then restrict eating a period to have a longer evening and I think this is an interesting question because actually uh, the answer to that is both these regimes are set up to help you control calorie intake mm -hmm. it's not there is there's no uh, magical impact on energy metabolism here uh, these are just strategies to help you avoid counting calories you know every hour of the day which can be incredibly stressful and difficult to do so and as you said actually we don't uh, prescribe dietary strategies based on sort of precision nutrition or personalized nutrition we don't have lifestyle medicine approaches we tend to say uh, this is a dietary regime it, and the fact is it may suit some people as you've said but other people might not find it easy to stick to so um, it's about finding a regime, if you're wanting to lose weight, that's going to help you control appetite and hunger and stick to the calorie deficit. Right, right. So um, in, in your study, it, the, they were given an isocaloric diet. I've always been confused about that term. So isocaloric diet means it's the, a maintenance diet. In other words, each person's evaluated based on the biometrics and, okay, you get 1,600 calories, you get 1,800 calories, or how does, how does that work? So what we do is um, measure resting energy requirements. So we use that, uh, we use a ventilated hood for measuring that, that's a form of indirect calorimetry. So instead of trying to guess how much energy somebody needs, we measure it and then we get the diets made up uh, to match those resting energy requirements for that individual. Because remember, we're comparing each individual to themselves. We're not comparing them to Joe and Jesse. Um, so we're not comparing across subjects. So 
Isocaloric simply means the same amount of calories on both diet treatments. So yes, we do have a run-in period. We always have a maintenance period where they're fed to energy balance. And then we start the regime and we look at pre-post changes uh, with reference to you know, day zero and day, uh, well, week, uh, end of week four, day 28. Okay. So um, since each participant experienced each type of uh, eating plan, what did you find in the group that had the morning load versus the evening load? Yeah, so this is where we get to the exciting part. So what we found was that weight loss was identical. So on the morning loaded diet, they lost 3.33 kilos over four weeks. And on the evening load diet, they lost 3.38 kilos. So almost identical. And of course, you would expect that because we did feed them the same amount of calories going in and we measured energy expenditure using gold standard W water technique, which is a stable isotope. And we also uh, recorded that energy expenditure was similar. So these all tie up in terms of measuring changes in energy balance. We see a similar change in body weight, a similar energy intake and similar energy expenditure. So this really shows that uh, loading of calories at different times of the day did not influence energy metabolism. Were there, um, did, you, did you prescribe a specific uh, macro ratio? Like, uh, was it a high protein? Was it, talk about that. Yes, yeah, so, um, yes, we do. So um, in this study, we used uh, high protein diets. Yes, 30% protein. And that's because I know that people feel hungry when they're losing weight. And, you know, I want to help them with that. <laughs> don't want to be horrible. And um, so having a slightly higher amount of protein as a proportion of their weight loss diet helps um, control hunger. So both diets were identical composition, 30% protein. Um, did you measure any hormones uh, like ghrelin? Uh, to, to, uh, I mean, obviously, hunger is subjective, but there are markers of hunger. Did, did you look at uh, choleocystokinin? Did you look at ghrelin, anything like that? Yeah, so let's start with the subjective because this is really interesting, and then I'll tie into the gut hormones. So, so what we found was that on the big breakfast regime, when we asked the subjects during their lab visits to record hunger, and that's using the subjective appetite scales that you mentioned. But we also measured this during the free living um, setting. And we what we found is that subjects felt less hungry uh, and their appetite was lower when they consumed the big breakfast regime in comparison to the, the small breakfast. And that, that's really interesting because if we think about translating this from the lab environment, into the real world, really what we want to do is use dietary regimes that help people promote uh, sticking to the diet. So this type of uh, regime would tend to suggest that having a big breakfast was more effective or more efficient in controlling appetite. And you asked about uh, what physiological markers we measured. Yes, we, we measured gut hormones in the fasted, so before eating there was no change. But what we could see was that ghrelin was suppressed more uh, after the big breakfast meal. And remember, ghrelin is uh, traditionally called the hunger hormone. So if that was suppressed more, that ties in with what we found in terms of subjective reports, that, that hunger was suppressed more with the big breakfast regime. Fascinating. And, and, and you know, it, it's fascinating because it validates a lot of stuff that we think when, when, when we pay attention to, to these type of things. Um, so you, did, you didn't look any, at any other hormones like growth hormone or, or sex steroids, right? No, no, just the, the gut hormones. What the, the population, so, so was it all men, all women, men and women in this group? Yeah. So we, we recruited men and women. I can't give you a breakdown by, um, sex, it would be amazing to do that. That's one of the future areas for my research. 
because there's not enough power to, to do that. But it would be interesting to do distinct studies to see differences in in males and females. Yeah. You know, you know, um, it, it's only recently that scientists, especially in the pharmaceutical industry, are paying attention to women because before that, that pesky hormone estrogen always made things difficult for them to uh, test uh, uh, drugs and stuff. And now they're more sensitive to the fact that women and men are different. I said it. Okay. And so the, the, the uh, interesting thing is if when you look at women, we know appetite control changes de depending on, on menses, you know, where they are in their cycle. And so that means that you'd probably want to have a pre and post menopausal women too, in, in the female group, it would be very interesting to see, I mean, I'm sure there are differences between men and women in, in this context. It would be interesting to see what that is and look at progesterone and estrogen and testosterone at the same time, because I, I have to believe they're going to change more so in to a response to what foods are being eaten. You know, people who eat more fat tend to produce more testosterone and 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 cholesterol based hormones. And so I, that, that would be fascinating, too, to look at as well. Yeah, I think um, I'm interested in, uh, you know, I support women in science. I am a woman in science. And um, I, I'm keen to know more about um, the role of menopause as well. So pre-menopausal and post-menopausal women in terms of thinking about how that influences appetite control. So. Well, and, and not only influences appetite control, but we have lots of validating research now that shows it, it also uh, in, uh, influences lipogenesis and actually where the fat is actually stored. Um, so uh, estrogen specifically because the aromatase enzyme resides in fat cells. And one of the things that happens as uh, ovaries start to slow down is, uh, and there's a, two papers that show this, but when the ovaries start to slow down, uh, uh, female body starts to, to actually store more fat to get as to get aromatase to try to create estradiol uh, of, of, to make up for what the ovaries is. So the, I, I, you know, women are more complex. They can actually make a human being. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it, it, it all that, that that whole discussion really needs to be looked at because I, I you know, I feel terrible and I've done shows about this because I feel terrible about women who are told by the mainstream health and fitness gurus, just do more cardio, you know, just work out harder, just starve yourself more. And, and these women say, look, I, I, I'm not losing body fat. And, and, and I know that the universe of health and fitness gurus is saying, oh, bullshit. You know, if you, if you just ate less and move more, you'd be okay. But hormones play a profound effect on energy management and, and lipogenesis. So, anyway. I think um, that's too simple a message, isn't it? We could probably discuss that for the rest of the evening, the sort of move more, eat less um, sort of statement and that obesity is a highly complex disease um, that is progressive. And, uh, you know, I do a lot of work in working with people living with obesity. So those voices need to be heard. I know we're speaking a lot about very controlled and mechanistic studies, but I also do uh, other work, um, which is thinking about the lived experience and thinking about uh, how to support people living with obesity. So that's incredibly important. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to take a quick commercial break. Uh, we'll be back in two minutes to discuss further. Uh, you're listening to and watching Superhuman Radio. We're talking today with Professor Alexandra Johnstone, and uh, we, we will return shortly. Stay with us, please.
Remember those rectangular toaster pastries you used to love when you were a kid? Well, Legendary Foods has just made them better. The new cake-style tasty pastry is like nothing you've ever had before. With 20 grams of high-quality protein and less than one gram of sugar, you'll feel like you're cheating, but you're not. Go to shrnetwork.biz slash legendary and use the code SHR10 to save to save 10% off your purchase of tasty pastries. Now available in cookies and cream, red velvet cake, birthday cake, blueberry, strawberry, brown sugar cinnamon and hot fudge sundae go to shrnetwork.biz slash legendary and use code shr10 today there are lots of concerns about food supply today that's why you need white oak pastures white oak pastures will deliver food right to your doorstep you don't even have to go out and be disappointed by shopping in grocery stores the finest beef pork lamb duck and more can be found at white oak pastures and now they even have seafood and best of all white oak pastures has a negative carbon footprint which means that you don't have to feel guilty for eating your ribeye go to shrnetwork.biz slash white oak and use the code superhuman to save 15 percent off never before has a product been so appropriately named as botanic tonics feel free this plant-based elixir combines a variety of different effective compounds, all from raw plant materials that at different doses provide you with completely different experiences. A third of a bottle puts you in the zone and makes you very focused and is ideal for a non-stimulating pre-workout. It also has a mild analgesic effect for us older lifters who have soreness and little pains and aches that keep us from training as ferociously as we want. A half a bottle will create a mild euphoric effect that will allow you to forego consuming alcohol but still be socially lubricated and have fun. I have never had a product deliver on its name the way Botanic Tonics Feel Free does, and I won't ever be without it, and you shouldn't either. Go to shrnetwork.biz slash feel free and use the code SHR40 for 40% off your first order. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. P3OM from Bioptimizers is a patented prebiotic and probiotic supplement with Lactobacillus plantarum OM. It has now been upgraded to P3OM 2.0 with the addition of a superfood formulation that makes it two times stronger, as well as optimizes L plantarum strength. So it's more powerful than ever, which means that not only will it help you completely digest all animal proteins, it also reduces cortisol, causes deep relaxation and better sleep, and reduces stress. Go to shrnetwork.biz slash P3 hyphen OM today and use the code SHR10 to save 10% off. This is the Superhuman Channel, doing reps with the weight of the world. Welcome. My microphone is getting wonky. I think it's probably 17 years old. Maybe it's time to retire and get a new one. So um, in this study, you identify that the behavioral changes are probably why the uh, morning load people experienced uh, weight loss. But that's that. It, it was somewhat behavioral changes, too, even with the evening load, because they were still just eating two meals a day, right? My cat's come to say hello. Yeah, oh, come on. <laughs> How are you doing? Wow, that's a, fl- that's a fluffy cat. Holy mackerel. Yeah, he he wow. is a fluffy cat. There. Yes. Bye-bye. Um, so, yeah, that's an interesting question. No, they actually did have three meals a day. So lunch was the same uh, between both treatments. And uh, meal times are pretty similar. Uh, and fasting times are very similar. So, um what we're interested in here is whether there's a physiological response explaining why some of these studies previously had found an effect or a behavioural response. And we certainly found a behavioural response in terms of appetite control. So I think that's really interesting. We didn't really, and, and that, I suppose, drives the, the gut hormone, differences in gut hormone um, release. So um, we didn't find any evidence of physiological response in terms of energy utilisation. You know what's fascinating to me, uh, you know, after doing this show for 17 years, I realized I, I was always in search of the one thing. What's the one thing for this? And, and we are so complex. There is no one thing. There's, there's a plethora of things that, you know, my friend Joel Green likes to say people want to talk baby talk when it comes to nutrition. This is good. That's bad. And it's never that way. They're good and bad. 
uh, in different circumstances. So I remember uh, I started talking about ghrelin, G H a ghrelin agonist called GHRP6 back in 2006 because it, it suppresses some of the statin and increases the pulse, the natural pulsatility, uh, pulsatility of, of growth hormone. And But then I learned that a ghrelin agonist can actually shift uh, the way the body handles the meal and can increase lipogenesis. But that seems not to be the case. In, in Well, so the, the morning group didn't experience hunger as much. The evening load group experienced greater hunger throughout the day. I wonder if, if, if there was a ghrelin su suppression, if they would have lost a little bit more body fat. So yeah, that I mean that's an interesting question. The we did measure body composition using the four compartment model, and just quickly skip through that. That meant means that we're measuring bone mass by changes in mm -hmm. uh, DEXA, uh, deuterated deuterium for measuring changes in body water, and then measuring density for changes in fat mass and fat free mass, uh, and you can break that down to protein mass. So no, we didn't detect any changes uh, in differences in fat mass. You know, it was the same, similar degree of negative energy balance, similar uh, energy expenditure uh, between the, the groups. So no, body composition changes were very similar. But what I would say is that perhaps if we come back to the behaviour argument that, remember the big dinner group had a small breakfast. So that 20% of calories was consumed during the small breakfast. So that small snack, maybe we could call it, uh, meant that they were hungry throughout the rest of the day. So I suppose another way of thinking about this is thinking, you know, the big breakfast really helped control appetite and did set them up for the day in terms of appetite control. Mm -hmm. And that's really interesting. There are some I've done many studies looking at high protein diets. There's a hint in the literature that indeed protein is more satiating in the morning than the evening. Um, and I'm really fascinated by you know some of the mechanisms why that might be. Yeah, I, I have a very high protein diet. I, I eat a half a dozen eggs and generally three. I think in the UK they call them bangers, you know, large pork sausages in the morning. That's my first meal. But I train first. I get up. Mm -hmm. I get downstairs. I have a gym in my home. I get downstairs. I do uh, 30 minutes of cardio. I train and I train uh, very strenuously. Then I go upstairs. If I'm being totally honest, I take two IUs of growth hormone, BPC-157 and a little bit of oxytocin. And uh, I get hungry, really, really uh, hungry. And then I have my first meal. I don't know if that uh, training fast, it means anything, but I just I want to get when I wake up in the morning, I just want to get downstairs and get it over with. I want to get down to the gym and train and get it over with. And then I eat and then I move on. Um, do you think that um, training fasted, do you have any opinions on that? There's a lot of debate. Some people say it doesn't matter. Some people say it does. Do you think that you burn more calories or after a, a, an overnight fast? Uh, so it's really not my area. I don't I don't work in sports nutrition as such, but I think if we just come back to the statement you make, do you burn more calories um, relative to what than somebody who exercises in the evening? Do you know what I mean? Oh, no, There's lots versus, of different having, dimensions. Having, versus having your meal, uh -huh. letting it digest for a half hour, 45 minutes, and then going in mm -hmm. training. So um, that's interesting. All the subjects that we recruited in our study were fairly sedentary. Um, mm -hmm. So they weren't uh, regular exercisers. So that's perhaps something that we could you know, look at in the future in terms of how do these effects relate to people who are um, habitual, you know, you know, if we look at strength training or people who have high levels of energy expenditure, but I don't expect to see a difference. There might be subtle differences in appetite control, but in terms of energy metabolism, I think the effects would be the same. So now let's talk about something else that you and I talked about off the air. Um, I've always been a purist and I've always said when people say sugar is addictive, I say, no, it's not because collateral changes have to occur in the brain in order for a, a true addiction, the, the, the true uh, definition of addiction and, and, and habit forming 
and craving things isn't addiction. What do you think of that? Because your 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 specialty is to understand hunger. So what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that it's an interesting concept that um, people like to think that they are living with obesity because they have a food addiction. Um, certainly some work that we did a few years ago would tend to suggest that the concept of food addiction doesn't exist. It's not prevalent, at least. There are forms of eating as a form of behaviour where people can be um, have aberrant eating behaviours, such as binge eating disorder, which is sometimes linked to night eating disorder. But the term addiction is a very specific term. Uh, it's overseen by psychiatry, and they have a number of definitions that have to be applied. So if we're thinking about a food addiction, there would have to be a specific nutrient that would drive the addiction, and importantly, the behaviours of seeking that, but also the withdrawal symptoms as well. So um, eating as a food addiction, you know, food addiction doesn't exist. Some people will have patterns that might be aligned to an eating addiction because they will eat literally anything. It is not uh, specific to a nutrient. It's not specific to sugar. Sugar is very easy to eat, so is fat. But um, so, no, I, I generally speaking, I uh, wouldn't accept the term food addiction. Yeah, and, and neither do I. I mean, you know, and it and you made a good point. Um, what is the withdrawal like? You know, and like real addiction, has, you have a physical dependency. You have a, you, 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 it, there's a real, real withdrawal, even with caffeine. It, it's 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 a habit forming drug. It really is. But. It's not an addiction. I mean, if, if someone said to me, you know, you've got this rare cancer that is driven by caffeine, like I wouldn't use it anymore. I would just stop no, just like yeah. that. So that, that, that's interesting because eating is a form of behavior and we learn that behavior. So you learned that having the caffeine, uh, sometimes maybe in combination with you know, uh, sugar or glucose, um, gives you a lift. So I love coffee as well. It's one of my... Uh, my food habits is having a coffee first thing in the morning and it's just lovely but mm -hmm. I've learned to associate the uh, for caffeine the sort of uh, pharmacological um, sort of uh, feeling that you get from having caffeine the buzz feeling from consuming that beverage so that's something I've learned over time and I reinforce it day after day by having my cup of coffee first thing in the morning but you can unlearn it if it's learned you can unlearn it um so you favor the high protein diet and that's great um, I, I'm, I love that knowing that um what about the high fat diet the uh, ketogenic diet which has become one of the fad diets um that that pretty much was proved out also in, in Keckwick and Pawan's research um that the it, it, so the, the high fat group lost the most body fat. Well, no, no, they, they, they lost the most weight. The high protein group lost the most body fat, but they didn't lose the most weight because they had protein synthetic response to high protein. And only uh, the high carb group gained weight and significantly more body fat. You, you recall that study it was done in like 1956 or something like that. I, they were, they were, the UK, they, they, I think they were UK scientists too, actually. I need to have a look at that. I'm, I'm really interested in ketogenic diets. Uh, and I've published some work on, you know, high protein, low carbohydrate diets. Ketogenic diets, remember, mean that you're not consuming um, enough uh, carbohydrates to the brain. So the brain wants another fuel and you start producing beta hydroxybutyrate as one of the ketone bodies. And that's why we call it a um, ketogenic diet so and you're in a negative energy balance so high protein as you said uh, very high fat and extremely low carbohydrate and I stopped running these studies because what I noticed was they had a profound effect on the markers of gut health that we measured mm -hmm. uh, we collected fecal samples and you could see a dramatic decrease in the production of the short chain fatty acids and in particular butyrate. 
And Beauty Rate, if you remember, is one of the SDFAs that has thought to have protective effects in terms of gut health. So I suppose any weight loss diet, you need to what you need to do is balance the benefits of weight loss with the risks of the diet and these ketogenic diets are very restrictive so you you're lacking all those really beneficial whole grains that are needing to be going into the gut to feed the gut microbiome so you need to weigh up what would the benefit of this weight loss regime for a period of time to lose weight versus potential negative impact and you know that's an individual call that anybody needs to make with their clinician and one diet does not fit all people so for some people, this will be incredibly difficult regime to comply to because you're cutting out a whole food group, so carbohydrates. And what do you do when you come back to eating normally? So I wouldn't um, suggest that this type of diet is a diet for life. So how do, you do, how do you reintroduce a balanced diet, a healthy diet? That's incredibly difficult because uh, if we understand that obesity is progressive and relapsing, then I totally get that you then get the yo-yo dieting effect so you go on to go, uh, follow a specific dietary regime you come off it you gain weight you go back on again so you know that's that's why you know I, i've not done any more work on these types of ketogenic diets but i do use high protein diets but they are moderate carbohydrate so they're around about um 40 percent carbohydrate and about 30% fat. So um, that's why that's the composition that we use um, as standard in the in the lab. Uh, one last question, then we have to take our last break and then we'll wrap up the, the interview. A good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Lane Norton, is a vocal dissident of the low carb diet because he claims that um, people who eat the low carb diet tend to experience greater hunger. Uh, have you have you seen any truth in that low carb dieters and, and greater hunger than than because I know uh, I know both fat and protein increase satiety dramatically. So you would think that that would be adequate and carbs wouldn't play a role. But he he, he claims that low carb dieters uh, are hungry more. Often. Have you seen that? Uh, yeah. In fact, Lane Norton uh, emailed me uh, about the paper I've just published. So, oh. um, yeah. So. Um, so my understanding of um, ketogenic diets that are very low in carbohydrate is the ketones themselves can have an anorectic effect, which means it suppresses appetite. And in fact, if we look to the literature, we can see that um, ketogenic diets are used in clinical situations such as epilepsy, you know, to alter um, seizures uh, or yeah. to, to reduce seizures. Yes. So there's definitely something going on at a brain level and um, Katia Martin and uh, Norway have done uh, different uh, studies showing that people perhaps need different lowered amounts of carbohydrates to be ketogenic and there might be a gender effect. So not everybody responds in the same way. But yes, I would say that there's an advantage of a low carb, a ketogenic diet is the anorectic effect. Okay. All right. We're going to take our last commercial break. Stay with us. We'll be right back. I would easily say that I am the hugest proponent you will ever meet to doing anything that will improve the quality of my sleep. And that's because sleep is linked to just about every metabolic disorder we see in our population today. One of the easiest things you can do to improve the quality of your sleep is to get a pillow that can be shaped into the exact form factor that allows you to get your best night's sleep. And that is my pillow. I've been sleeping with my pillow for a few years now, and I can tell you that when I have to travel and stay in hotels, I don't get a good night's sleep because I don't have my pillow with me. Right now, you can save up to 60% off of everything offered to improve the quality of your sleep at shrnetwork.biz slash mypillow when you use the code SHR. Or you can call toll-free 800- 
888-889-4938. And remember to use code SHR to save up to 60% off of everything at their website. P3OM from Bioptimizers is a patented prebiotic and probiotic supplement with Lactobacillus plantarum OM. It has now been upgraded to P3OM 2.0 with the addition of a superfood formulation that makes it two times stronger, as well as optimizes L plantarum strength. So it's more powerful than ever, which means that not only will it help you completely digest all animal proteins, it also reduces cortisol, causes deep relaxation and better sleep and reduces stress. Go to shrnetwork.biz slash P3 hyphen OM today and use the code SHR10 to save 10% off. Dogs should be powered by fat and protein, not carbs. That's why Visionary Pet makes low-carb, ketogenic dog food for dogs of all breeds and life stages. From kibble to freeze-dried and even low-carb treats, all Visionary Pet recipes are very low-carb, ketogenic, and made with 100% real meat protein. Shop now and use code SHR for 20% off your first order today. Your dog deserves the lifelong benefits of optimal nutrition. Make the switch to Visionary and see why smart dogs eat low carb. There have been no real breakthroughs in resistance training for over 200 years. Whether it's pulleys or free weight, they all depend on gravity and the angles associated with gravity's effect directly on the weight. All of that has changed with the ARX machine. ARX stands for adaptive resistance. The ARX machine uses a 25 horsepower motor. You are literally fighting against a 25 horsepower motor. So every single rep is your one rep maximum at that moment in time. But ARX RX leverages another technique that has been known to produce rapid muscle gains and strength, and that is it leverages the eccentric or negative portion of the rep, which completely blows every other exercise and resistant training product out of the water. Go to shrnetwork.biz slash ARX and discover the future of resistance training. This is the Superhuman Channel, where brawn and brains finally meet. Welcome back. So, Professor Johnstone, what would you like uh, both lay people and clinicians to take away from this most recent paper? Uh, yeah, that, that's a great question. I suppose um, the paper suggests that having a, a bigger breakfast uh, can be a really uh, efficient way of, or we can consider it a tool, a single tool in the toolkit to help people uh, comply to a weight loss regime. Because at the end of the day, weight loss will occur when energy intake is less than energy expenditure. And uh, what we need to do is do uh, more studies on this new science of chrononutrition um, to try and understand in the real world how you know, timing of eating we can use to help people control body weight. You know, there's another aspect to this um, that plays into older people like me, 64. I never thought I'd call myself old. I never thought of myself as old, but I definitely am getting older. Um, Dr. Dale Bredesen, who um, has been on this show uh, two or three times, um, after his first study at UCLA with 20 patients, Alzheimer's patients, where he reversed all the symptoms of Alzheimer's, and then he did a, a multi-centered study uh, with 200 patients and they reproduced that success. And then he wrote his uh, New York Times bestselling book, An End to Alzheimer's, which doesn't get enough publicity and I don't understand why. Uh, one of the key changes that he made in the people who were suffering from Alzheimer's disease was uh, early to bed and stop eating three hours before bedtime because there's a degraded, degraded degree of autophagy that occurs in the brain when you're not sleeping on a full or partially full stomach. And I, and so I, I was a, I started intermittent fasting after Dr. Mark McCarty came on my show in 2008 with the first rat study that showed an upregulation of sirtuins and all these anti-aging, you know, magic uh, uh, things. And, and, and I did it for so long that it, it really wasn't working for me after a while. I, I wasn't staying lean. I had to work harder and harder to stay lean. And so I shifted to this uh, time-restricted feeding that you implied before. Well, now I have a big breakfast 
and I have an eating window, and my last meal must be done. I, I'm done chewing by 6 p.m., and I'm in bed by 9, 9.30. And mm-hmm. my body has responded so much better. I am leaner now than I've been in a long time. Um, I'm still carrying a lot of muscle. So it hasn't interrupted the anabolic response of feeding. And I feel better. I, I wake up in the morning clear headed. I feel better. So I, I like this idea. If we can start getting people to look, you, you can still respect your time res- restricted feeding that you feel is magical, which there is a degree of, from, from an evolutionary perspective that it probably is. But instead of starving all day and then having this huge meal where you just go out of control and eat everything in front of uh, in front of you late in the evening, shift it, you know, have your first meal in the morning, eat throughout the day sensibly, have your last meal earlier in the day than typical and sleep with an empty stomach. What do you think of that? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I think um, if I come back to the science, which is my sort of comfort zone. So when my paper was published in Cell Metabolism, it was actually a special issue. And the special issue was on diet and exercise. So there was a whole bundle of amazing papers, one of which I reviewed uh, by Frank Shear's group. And what they did was the opposite of what uh, we did. And they looked at late eating specifically uh, moving um, the time at meeting to be um, eating at 9.30 p.m. So three hours before uh, sleep um, initiation. And what they found was that late eating increased hunger. This is not, this is exactly the same, the opposite. Uh, so it's a big dinner regime, exactly what we found. It increased uh, hunger. It decreased energy expenditure and core body temperature. It, they took fat biopsies and uh, when they looked at the adipose tissue gene expression, it favoured increased lipid storage. So really in combination, that paper uh, would tend to support that rate eating increases obesity risk in humans. So I think there's a lot of, because these techniques are well controlled it was a well conducted study albeit short term over three days and i think that we're now at the stage of science that we have all these amazing tools that we can look at changes in metabolism and behavior in order to you know understand um, ways to help control obesity but at the same time uh, we all want to live longer and we want to live well so uh, that's the holy grail of dieting um, and that, that's incredibly difficult to understand across the many phenotypes and I could even say genotypes then of uh, obesity that exist. I want to thank you so much for making time to come on the show. This has been fascinating and I think that the audience has learned a lot. I know I've learned a lot and, uh, and, and, and uh, I hope that when you publish your next paper, you'll come on. I'd love to. It's really nice chatting about science, isn't it? Okay. Thank you so much. Take care. And we're going to let you go. Bye-bye. Okay. So we're going to take a quick commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to be joined by Dr. Quinn Wang. And we're going to talk about peptide. You know that I love peptides. I've been talking about peptides since 2006 on this show. The first peptide I actually talked about was recombinant IGF-1. The second was GHRP6. Those both happened in 2006. And ever since then, we've been talking about peptides on the show. So if you're fascinated by peptides, as I am, uh, you should always make sure to look to my website, superhumanradio.net. And we have a specific series called the Pep Talk, uh, where we explore emerging peptides. Peptides are amazing because they're intercellular signals. They're not like pharmaceutical drugs that mask symptoms. They're actually little protein messages that tell your cells what to do. Very, very fascinating. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with Dr. Quinn Wang.
Never before has a product been so appropriately named as Botanic Tonics Feel Free. This plant-based elixir combines a variety of different effective compounds, all from raw plant materials that at different doses provide you with completely different experiences. A third of a bottle puts you in the zone and makes you very focused and is ideal for a non-stimulating pre-workout. It also has a mild analgesic effect for us older lifters who have soreness and little pains and aches that keep us from training as ferociously as we want. A half a bottle will create a mild euphoric effect that will allow you to forego consuming alcohol but still be socially lubricated and have fun. I have never had a product deliver on its name the way Botanic Tonics Feel Free does and I won't ever be without it and you shouldn't either. Go to shrnetwork.biz slash feel free and use the code SHR40 for 40% off your first order. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. There have been no real breakthroughs in resistance training for over 200 years. Whether it's pulleys or free weight, they all depend on gravity and the angles associated with gravity's effect directly on the weight. All of that has changed with the ARX machine. ARX stands for Adaptive Resistance. The ARX machine uses a 25 horsepower motor. You are literally fighting against a 25 horsepower motor. So every single rep is your one rep maximum at that moment in time. But ARX leverages another technique that has been known to produce rapid muscle gains and strength. And that is it leverages the eccentric or negative portion of the rep, which completely blows every other exercise and resistant training product out of the water. Go to shrnetwork.biz slash ARX and discover the future of resistance training. There are lots of concerns about food supply today. That's why you need White Oak Pastures. White Oak Pastures will deliver food right to your doorstep. You don't even have to go out and be disappointed by shopping in grocery stores. The finest beef, pork, lamb, duck, and more can be found at White Oak Pastures. And now they even have seafood. And best of all, White Oak Pastures has a negative carbon footprint, which means that you don't have to feel guilty for eating your ribeye. Go to shrnetwork.biz slash white oak and use the code superhuman to save 15% off. Dogs should be powered by fat and protein, not carbs. That's why Visionary Pet makes low-carb, ketogenic dog food for dogs of all breeds and life stages. From kibble to freeze-dried and even low-carb treats, all Visionary Pet recipes are very low-carb, ketogenic, and made with 100% real meat protein. Shop now and use code SHR for 20% off your first order today. Your dog deserves the lifelong benefits of optimal nutrition. Make the switch to Visionary and see why smart dogs eat low carb. This is the Superhuman Channel, where we use oxygen for the power of good. We're joined by Dr. Quinn Wang. Welcome to the show, Dr. Wang. Hi, hello, good afternoon. Thank so, you for me. Uh, I'm fascinated by peptides. Uh, I've been fascinated by peptides for a very, very long time. And we've talked about them. And we've talked about obscure peptides like ARA290, which seems to uh, be effective on small nerve uh, uh, neuropathy. Uh, we've talked about the basic peptides like the the, the growth hormone secretagogues, um, PE2228, which is uh, very effective as a uh, antidepressant um, a peptide, which has a very, very fast onset and seems to, uh, after you use it for about 30 to 40 days, it seems to have prolonged effect. Um, the list goes on and on. I, I, I can't even, BP157, uh, and they, they, we talked about all of them. But this one really fascinated me because... Um, I, I've, I've always thought it logical. Uh, first of all, intranasal delivery of peptides that you just want to go to the brain versus systemic delivery, I've, I'm fascinated with. But also, this one seems to work on people with Alzheimer's and seizures, right? Right, yes. So how did you discover this? So was this a, is this um, a small domain of another peptide that you extracted and used for this specific purpose? Talk about it. So, yeah, so the, we come to this peptide um, after about a decade of um, uh, basic science research in the lab. Um, so, um, so we get to this. Um, this peptide is related to uh, a particular protein in the brain. Um, so the, this protein, we call it, uh, it's a 
cell surface receptor. And um, it can react to a neuromodulator called adenosine. <clears throat> so basically, in the brain, whenever you have a, a, then a, a attack right to the brain, either it is um, ischemia or is um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, is, is a um, uh, excitatory um, uh, damage or is a brain injury, uh, then the the brain. It itself actually like to protect itself to mm -hmm. uh, by releasing this neuromodulator called called uh, adenosine. So with adenosine, then um, the you know it can prevent further um, damage or neuronal death. Um, so adenosine has to work on this receptor. We call it is a is a protein on the cell uh, surface. So um, it does that. Um, then uh, it can activate a series of um, intracellular response so that the neurons can be protected. Um, but as many, you know, different processes in nature, right? You have one process and then uh, Mother Nature usually wants to keep it um, under control, right? Controllable. So they always have another process to counteract it. So everything is in balance. So uh, in the brain, there is also a mechanism actually can uh, hamper this um, activity of this uh, adenosine. So, um, so in that sense, um, adenosine cannot do its full job. So what we found is really a mechanism that we can unleash this native protection. Uh, so this peptide can um, interfere this negative regulation of the protective effect of adenosine. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's how it works. This is fascinating. So I, I, I'm sorry to say that I didn't realize this was an adenosine receptor uh, agonist. Right? Is that what the it's topic not is really an agonist? I would not see that because by itself, it would not do anything to the receptor. It just uh, enhances what adenosine can do to the receptor. So this is fascinating. So yes, you're right. There's lots of uh, excitatory. Uh, chemicals that we we put in our body caffeine uh caffeine blocks the adenosine receptor and and prevents sleep load sleep pressure so um, and and people with alzheimer's disease and um and even seizures um it, it it's thought that they the, the, re the receptors become overwhelmed with uh excitement and they freeze and so they people can't remember things or people uh, go, go, you know, the brain just freezes and you go into a seizure. So are you saying that this is the way this peptide works? It, 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 it suppresses that, that freeze, so to speak? Um, in somewhat, yeah, it's a uh, point. You can see that. Um, yeah, so obviously, um, you know, Alzheimer's is such a complex disease and yeah. involves so much, right? But just talk about seizure, you know, at the time, as I said, the brain was just super activated um so we want to actually calm it down here so um this peptide will help adenosine to calm down the the brain so when you have a seizure you definitely want to you know away stay away from caffeine right so you right yeah so does that also mean that this this uh peptide could be, be repurposed uh for a rapid onset sleep pressure drug so that like people who can't get to sleep would they get sleepy oh yes yes oh. <laughs> right no because you know what oh, there, there's, right. there's a there's a compounding pharmacy in in kentucky they don't they don't make peptides anymore because they got their hands slapped by the fda but um i wanted them to make uh adenosine for me that i wanted to conv combine with melatonin and put it into an intranasal body because um, DMSO is an ideal solvent for melatonin, and and it would also work with a peptide. And I thought, wouldn't that be wonderful to have a you puff puff, and you go to sleep? <laughs> you know, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this is fascinating to me. Wow. So this is an adenosine uh, type peptide. That's fascinating. Um, how long does it? work? Is there a half-life to it? Do you have to use it all day long if you have uh, seizures and stuff like that? 
So um, that's a very good question. So um, so in terms of you know, how we will be able to use it in human, that definitely requires a lot of research. So right now, we're still at the stage with, you know, we tested it in um, animal models. Um, so there we know um, acutely, right? So when you, you give the mouse um, peptide and then it can protect them from the injury, mm -hmm. right? Um, if it has a very short half-life, could you use some of the uh, technologies that are currently used um, for uh, um, like uh, IGF-1 long R3 that have drug affinity complexes that keep them uh, circulating? Uh, they attach us to albumin, I think, and it's, it stays a lot. Could you use one of those to give it a prolonged effect? So, yeah, that's a good point. So at this point, I would not say it has a short half lap yet because uh, certainly this peptide requires a lot of optimization and increases um, availability and, and uh, stability definitely one one important issue here um, and as you said you can use some kind of um, you know um, carrier right to to keep it longer um, but also keep in mind if we can just give it through the nasal route and then it will, it will skip the, the circulation so that's actually a plus but we have little information right now about you know how long it will stay in the brain mm -hmm. right now yeah um would w so there's lots of uh amazing peptides for the brain like epitalon penalon um would those peptides be appropriate to in include with this peptide you think to give some sort of a uh combination uh you're suppressing the damage and you're healing the brain at the same time um that's a possibility. Um, definitely, you want to do you know as much as possible, right? Um, prevent the damage at the same time. You want to give um, healing, um, but I am not sure um, about the drug interaction. At this right. Point. Um, uh, certainly, you know there has to be carefully evaluated. Yeah. So this would be a a a rescue. This could potentially. I know I have to say potentially. Uh, this could potentially be a rescue. Uh, agent for someone who has just uh, experienced an uh, an ischemic event a stroke right yeah exactly right right so um there, so there is there is a peptide and I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with it it's called thymosin beta 4. are you familiar with that one thymosin beta 4 it's it's a uh, it's actually, a thymus uh -huh. it's a thymus peptide mm -hmm. and it's been shown to be effective against ischemia, both in the brain and in the heart. Okay. Uh, there's a, a, two studies out there, and one showed that a four milligram dose of thymosin beta-4 within four hours of both a heart or a brain ischemic event completely uh, blocked any collateral damage. Like, like, like six weeks later, it didn't even look like you had a stroke or, or a heart attack. So this would be great to use with that. One would suppress the damage acutely and, mm -hmm. and that, that thymus and beta four could actually be reparative. Right. That's a, a great. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's a good peptide yeah, for you to, to check yes. out thymus and beta four. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, so, what are the next steps for this peptide? I mean, it's going to take years for this to be available uh, uh, post clinical trials, right? I mean, about four or five years, you think? That's correct. Um, that will definitely take years to fully develop its, uh, this peptide for human use. That's for sure. Is there, is there any potential negative effects that you, uh, you, you saw in, in, with the rodents? Uh, with the rodents, um, no, actually, we have not seen any. Um, um, you know, potential like side effects because uh, this is actually related to um, this agent itself because it's not a ligand, so it's not going to activate the receptor everywhere um, because mm -hmm. this receptor is expressed everywhere, not just in the brain, but in your heart and lung and kidney as well. So the, the, the beauty of this um, peptide is it's just going to enhance the effect of adenosine wherever it is, it, it is needed. Right. So in the brain, when you have a damage coming and your brain is going to release a lot of adenosine there. So you're not going to have this massive release of adenosine in your heart at the, you know, when you have a brain damage. Right? right. So, you know, this 
of time just going to go there to go to the brain and enhance the adenosine effect in the brain because all the effect requires adenosine itself. So, so I would see this as um, it's right at the place um, where it, it, it is needed and right at the time it is needed. Yeah, but is that because you're delivering it intranasally? I mean, if you gave it systemically, it would find its way to the brain eventually, right? Right. So even systemically, right, it will go to the brain, it will go to other organs, but you will have a enhanced, uh, you know, agonist there or ligand there. In other I organs. see. I see. So, so it, it, it's, it's, it's almost intelligent. It's going to go wherever the load of adenosine appears. Right. Exactly. That's fascinating. I mean, I can see so many uses for this. People abuse caffeine, um, and it's very, very hard to to get off of caffeine. And I think that uh, a peptide like this may be something that could be used to help people um, eliminate their, their their dependence on caffeine because of the interplay between caffeine and adenosine is just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Right. Just, just, wow, this is really exciting. But we really don't have any other information to talk about at this. So it. Is there a name for this peptide right now? I mean, I, I understand it's, a, it's, it's still in the development stages, but do you have a name yeah. for this peptide? We just call it an AYR peptide. It's, okay. a, it's a related to and the, the AYR R1. Right. And yeah. what is the, what is the uh, C? So it's A1RCT. Right, what right. The CT, C is, is, it stands for C-terminal. Ah, C-terminal. C right, yeah. This is very exciting. So, uh, do uh, is that all you do is work on peptides or specific peptides or what is oh, the? Oh no, no, our work. You mean my what my research? Um, yeah. No, actually, um, no. Uh, this is just uh, one project. Yeah, work uh, going in my lab. Um, my lab in general, we work. We call it translational neuropharmacology. So we have a broad interest. Uh, we study the brain function. Um, so. At the sense, you know, um, at the receptor level, uh, how receptor function in a normal brain or in the disease brain. Mm -hmm. uh, so, are we? So we want to know actually in the disease brain. So what's wrong there, right? And and how we can correct that. So we develop all these different uh, therapeutic strategies um, for the disease treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, for Alzheimer's, this is um, only one project related to Alzheimer's. Um, because this really Alzheimer's really big. So when we talk, think about, you know, what's in common about Alzheimer's and, and seizure, right? So, so that's because in most Alzheimer's disease patients, they do have seizure going on there. Oh, I uh, never knew that. Right. Yeah, right. So this two actually um, really um, hard to separate because um, in Alzheimer's, um, their brain, so when you see the, you know, the disease progression, right? So so while you're building up all those patho pathogens, right, or, or pathogenic factors, and then your brain become hyperactive. Mm -hmm. And, and the, there's this brain connectivity is much increased. And often the patients have seizures, but most time they are silent seizures instead of they have those all those movement, right? Um, right. But the, the so it's hard to, to catch up, right? Um, but the prevalence is very high. So even the conservative estimation is over like 64%, but some study even suggests like 80% of Alzheimer's patients, they do have moments of the seizures going on in their brain. So um, so we that's how you know we get to um, this connection between seizure and Alzheimer's. And also we did test this um, peptide in Alzheimer's model uh, movements, right? So. So we want just it, it actually is uh, effective to to really calm down those hyperactive you know um, Alzheimer's brain in, in those role models. Uh, so that's how we get to this. Um, in, I got I got. It sounds to me like Alzheimer's is the polar opposite of meditation. Where meditation, you're slowing down thought, you're you're listening to silence. Right. The Alzheimer's brain is it's run away. It's just it's running. And, 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 and that's why. So people think, oh, you've got Alzheimer's disease. You're sitting there and nothing's going on in your brain when, in fact, 100 miles an hour is going on in your brain. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So uh, I, when people think is nothing going on, it's probably at the very, very, very end stage uh, when the brain already very much degenerated. Mm -hmm. But you think about this is several decades of progression. Right. 
um, at the beginning, exactly as you said, there are a lot going, a lot going on in the brain, um, and those patients uh, they are often actually agitated. So a big issue with Alzheimer's disease is not really, of course, dementia is horrible, but you know, you know, more um, horrible or devastating is um, the psychiatric problem. So you often in those patients you see the behavior change and the personality right. change. Right. Yeah. So all those actually um, cause a lot of um, uh, trouble, and uh, you know, so hard to care. You know, if, if you think about it from a, a healthcare, you know, healthcare point of view, right? Um, so, so the caregivers, there's a lot of burden to them to take care of uh, Alzheimer's patients with all these behavior alterations. Um, so, yeah. So, so that's exactly um, something going on in the Alzheimer's brain. Um, there, are, there's hyperactive before the neurons are you know really died right right and and we know that excitatory agents like uh, glutamate they excite the brain but right. then they burn that, that they burn that area of the brain out from from right. exactly. over, uh, over uh right. over production over sensitization you know what i was i was talking uh, to my previous guest uh, professor john stone about dietary regimens right we talked about the ketogenic diet and it's interesting to me that the ketogenic diet is effective for both Alzheimer's patients and seizure patients, epilepsy. Right, exactly. And, and so is there any connection with what this peptide does and what the, the ketogenic diet or the presence of uh, ketones does to, to this, uh, uh, what do I want to call it, this aged brain, this brain? Yeah, right. I, actually, I'm glad I'm right after her. Actually, um, the ketogenic diet, guess what, um, it really can enhance adenosine um, receptor signaling. So, mm -hmm. so they can boost your adenosine response in the brain. Uh, that's, that's how it can actually work on those seizures, um, um, you know, patients. And, it's, you know, if the Alzheimer's patient, they have seizure going on, right, and definitely it's going to help the Alzheimer's patients because, you know, all this, you see all this hyperactivity, they are actually can worsen all the Alzheimer's related symptoms and even the, you know, the disease progression. So what you're saying is the ketogenic diet promotes a, 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 a better production of? Uh, of that's it. Right, yeah. Fascinating. That is fascinating. Um, is there anything else you want to talk about in your area of work? I, I mean, I feel like we've covered the, the important stuff here. Right. I think so, too. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. I hope you'll come back on as this project progresses and you start doing human trials and stuff like that. Yeah, I'd be happy to if we get oh. to that. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Wang. Sure. Bye bye. My pleasure. So that is really exciting. When will that peptide be ready? I am looking forward to it. Um, that's it for today. I do have a show tomorrow, I believe. It's tomorrow. For, yeah, Friday. We have a show tomorrow. Let's see what it is. Let's just look. Just stay with me for a second. Uh, so tomorrow podcast is ageless sexuality with Susan Bratton, uh, intimacy and wellness expert. We're going to be talking with her. Uh, I'm sure that's going to be a lively conversation. I'll try not to be too stupid during that interview. You know, um, we're having a lot of problems with Facebook and, and YouTube. They just, they want to suppress this kind of information. It's, it's amazing to me. They, they don't want us to talk about this stuff. Uh, you know, shut up and obey. That's the that's the new message. And I'm going to find another platform. And I hope all of you follow me. Those of you who have been tuning in live all these years, I hope you'll follow me to make sure that you know about this uh, when it's coming. I would appreciate it if you go to superhumanradio.net, go down to the bottom right hand side of the homepage, and sign up for our email list. We will not bother you. We, I don't think we've sent an email newsletter out in two months, three months. Um, we won't bother you, but I have to find a workaround from these organizations that want to sil silence what I've been doing for 17 years. And that is delivering cutting edge information about health, nutrition, drugs, exercise, everything. They, they want it. They want to stop me. And I'm not that big of a guy. If I was bigger, maybe if I was like a Joe Rogan, I could, you know, the tail wagging the dog here and I can do something, but I'm too small to fight them. Uh, but if I can take this message and move it to a different platform, I intend to. I'm, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of being slapped on the hand for things that I'm, I'm not doing. I'm not 
telling people bad things to do. Uh, misinformation. That that word, 100 years from now, they'll talk about this period of time uh, in society and the nonsense about suppression of, of speech. All right, look, share the show. That's another way that you can help the show get the message out. I'm, I'm asking you to share good information that's going to help people. They're going to they're gonna love you for sharing it. So share the show, and we'll see you tomorrow with more Superhuman Radio. And uh, thank you for patronizing and being here today.